Good evening, everyone. My name is Natalie Nelson. I'm the director here at the Pence Gallery. Thank you so much for coming to our artist talk with our wonderful participating artists from the Bay Area Clay Show. Um, we are not amplifying this, so we're going to try to speak up loud, but we are videoing it. So we're going to have a question and answer period at the end. So if everyone could step up to the mic and speak their question, we'll get to record you on video. So that would be great. So happy to see you guys all here. I know some of you came last night to our opening, um, which was really spectacular. I thought it was important that we have a talk with the artists to really hear directly from them. We don't have all the artists here, of course, um, but I did want to thank and welcome the following artists who are all participating artists. We have Lisa Reinertsen, who's also going to talk about being the curator of the show, Monica Vanden Duel, um, Arthur Gonzalez, Mark Lancet, and Aaron Toole. I am going to function more as the moderator, um, and we do have some questions for the artists, but we thought it was really important to hear from the artists themselves. So we're going to give them basically 10 minutes each to talk about kind of the socio-political critique of their work. Um, what, what is their theme? What is something that is very important to them that they're delving into in their work? Um, and how are they trying to convey that? So it's a big topic, art and politics. Um, and we're also going to hear from Lisa Reinertsen. How did this project come about? Because it's changed when she first conceived it. It was a different, very different time period. Um, and so she's going to talk a little bit about pulling this show together, which is quite the amazing show if you've seen it. Um, I do want to thank our sponsors quickly, um, the City of Davis, the Andreessen Fund, Jim and Sue Smith, and Tandem Properties helped us support all of the programming you see as well as the exhibit, which was no small feat. If you want to help support us, support the pens, buy a catalog. Thank you. Buy a piece. Um, without further ado, oh. um, I'm going to turn it over to Lisa Reinertsen, um, who's going to be talking about the evolution of the show. Thank you, Natalie. Um, yeah, I do want to just say a brief thank you to um, all of the artists that have hung in there with me throughout. This is the third uh, evolution of, of this show. that was first uh, proposed at the National Ceramic Conference in Portland uh, at Ansica, which was wonderful, trucking all our stuff up there. Um, and then again at Arts Benicia, and um, we've produced a catalog about the show. And then, um, I, so far this is our final show <laughs> here at the Pence. Um, so anyway, um, you know, the panelists that are here, I want to thank all of you guys for participating in this tonight, but um, all the artists that aren't here, to uh, hopefully if you have some questions about their work, um, some of us can answer. It's not a, oh, speak even louder, sorry. This is just, yeah, yeah. I'll try to speak louder. <laughs> Um, anyway, I just it, this was a community effort, and I really appreciate all of the artists. Uh, in the first place, all the amazing work they've done, and all the lugging of art back and forth. Um, it's been really wonderful working with everybody here. Um, a little bit about um, why did I do this show? What inspired me? Can can you guys hear me well enough? Sorry, it's and you want to move up? There's yeah, pull, too. yeah, you might want to come up closer. Um, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to back off up to when I was uh, growing up in Sacramento, um, all the way back to my teenage years, I've been um, immersed in this world of ceramics. I started working with clay as a teenager, and uh, the candy store gallery, how many of you have heard of the candy store gallery in here? Okay, not, not that many. Um, there, it was a little gallery up in the town of Folsom, outside of Sacramento, um, east of Sacramento. And there was a woman, Adeliza, that started this little gallery. And she brought in the funk artists. She brought in Robert Arneson was there, and um, David Guhuli was showing there, Clayton Bailey was showing there, and uh, other artists also. But. Um, you know, so I, I was exposed to that work early on and thought it was really wonderful and um, knew, you know, there was really pretty exciting ceramic scene that was happening um, and that would have been in the sort of late 60s for me. And, um, and with all of that work, you know, through humor, a lot of the funk work, there was, 
you know, a side of that that was, uh, you know, uh, addressing social political issues in humorous ways, or, or s sometimes it wasn't necessarily social political, but um, there was this content in the work. And, uh, you know, so some of these early ceramic artists, uh, such as Bob Arneson, um, Viola Fry, Stephen DeStabler, uh, I saw them as all being artists that they decided to take on clay as a fine art medium and to address some of the same concerns that fine art painters or sculptors were working with. Uh, pop art was a big thing in the 60s and I think pop art influenced funk quite a bit. Um, I mean I can even see with Richard Shaw's work here that trompe l'oeil work but he's also depicting objects from our daily lives and through that, making commentary about the society we're in and what we have as objects or how we live our lives. Um, so I, and Viola Fry's work, I think, um, especially some of the later, later work, uh, there were gender issues, especially when she started doing these giant figures and businessmen in giant suits. And you know, there were um, to topics that she was addressing in that work. And then Stephen DeStabler, very different uh, side of things, but there was more of sort of a spiritual aspect and looking, um, I, I guess all of the work I'd say in that time had a, a level of humanism and social consciousness to it that really did inspire um, everyone here at the table, I would guess, and, I guess, and probably everyone in the show. And so, um, so there are a few things about this. The title, you know, Bay Area Clay, I do think this Northern California region, and Bay Area, I'm extending all the way to Davis and Sacramento, <laughs> Folsom, um, there was this community of artists that influenced each other and inspired one another. A lot of people got, ended up at TB9. Um, several of us in the show were students there um, with Bob Arneson, at temporary building number nine here at UC Davis. Um, so they're part of it, the Bay Area region, I think, um, had its own thing happening. Um, and the social consciousness, the you know, legacy of social consciousness, I think that these early artists influenced their students or other people that just observed what they were doing. And, and you know, some of the people in the show, um, you know, like Wan Xing is in this show. He, his background as an artist was in China and he came out here and was incredibly influenced by Arneson's work and the freedom of the funk art that was happening and how that impacted the work he's doing now. So whether it was a direct influence um, with teacher or just by seeing the art, you know, you learn by looking at the art, um, that social consciousness permeated um, th through this work and Sorry, I'm stumbling here. Um, but the legacy part of it, where I think um, these ideas have been passed on. And again, most everybody in this exhibition uh, is connected as either sort of mentor or educator in some way themselves, um, you know, either as teachers or Aaron's the, uh, well, you've been a teacher too, but you've been the tech at UC Berkeley. Um, people have. <laughs> And, you know, Richard Knott can, uh, you know, he does workshops all over the place. You know, so in some way or another, all these people for the last, you know, somewhere between 40 and 20 years or so have also been influencing, you know, the younger generation of students. So I sort of see us as sort of a second generation group of people. Um, and again, why did I want to have this show? I don't want to be a curator, and I really see myself as an artist part of this community, but I felt like... I, I wanted to tell this story of the social consciousness and the you know the political aspect, uh, political social aspect. And a lot of the artists really keep it very subtle and didn't necessarily want me to talk about it. It's like, well, that's that subtle thing that people may or may not get in my work. Don't make me talk about it. Um, but I wanted to bring it to the surface, and um, and I, I could talk about the the fact that I came up with the idea about a year before this terrible election that happened um, and presented it to NSICA and so then it just suddenly seemed really timely to everybody uh, when that you know the exhibition happened in February after that last election um, but it's been really a wonderful trip with you guys and um, I think at this point I'll pass it along to let you guys talk about you know your own work your own work <laughs> yes I guess that's me, because I'm sitting next to you. Monica, you're next. Uh, can you guys hear me with this half yelling voice? That, yeah. yeah.
So oh, oh, yeah, because it's uh, Does it work? that's for the that, no, it's oh, just it's for, just for the camera. For the camera. Huh. So I could be yelling into the camera. Yeah. yeah All right. Um, uh, okay. Well, it's hard for me to just sort of start uh, talking uh, blankly. Question I, one number I'll, one. I'll start with question okay. number one. <laughs> but I'm also more than happy if you guys have questions or interjections or objections. Um, just please ask me questions just to kind of keep the conversation going a little bit. Um, but of course, I also want to thank Lisa and the Pence for hosting this last, uh, hopefully not last, but last for now, <laughs> version of the exhibition, and for uh, Lisa for putting all her love and uh, energy and labor into keeping this party rolling uh, to the third stop here. Um, it's a lot of work, uh, but it's been a lot of fun as well, so very happy to be here. Um, and I was also happy to be included in the exhibition. I think I would put myself in the category of, I don't think of myself first as sort of artist with social consciousness, um, I think when Lisa and I were talking one day, I responded to the idea of like humanism um, as being kind of a constant in my work. Um, so I think, you know, two of the three pieces, the like still life pieces, are the work that sort of started. Can you guys really hear me? Yeah? Okay. Okay. Just, <laughs> are you just pretending to? See, they can't in the very back row. So I'm going to have to yell even a little louder. <laughs> If it's loud there, it's hard. Don't worry about that. <laughs> All right. Sorry, you guys. I'll, I'll, I'll try to talk a little louder. Um, so I would say like the two sort of still life pieces that are in the exhibition are, 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 are what I started uh, round one of, the, of this exhibition with. And I, uh, Sorry, the, the mic's only for the camera. Oh, yeah. The mic doesn't work for the people. It's not for the people. It's just for the camera. <laughs> you can move your chairs up to the sides. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. You're All right. interrupted. Yeah, it's tiring. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's hard to continue in these circumstances. Here. Yes. Settle down on the, settle down on the wings over there. Oh, uh, what was I even saying? Oh, uh, so the piece that I kind of uh, snuck in that was, I, I think, more of a kind of an environmental response that was more recent is that uh, fire, the flame piece, which. Uh, there, that's kind of my newest series of work is a lot of things that are on fire. And the big flame was, you know, sort of the first most obvious uh, version of that new series. So that one feels like uh, a little bit more of a direct response to, uh, to not just the actual fires and the uh, environmental degradation that's become more and more obvious going on around us, but just kind of a feeling of like panic and urgency, I think, that, that might be in the air. Uh, I think is kind of what uh, got that series rolling for me. Um, and another question that I responded to in this list, there's, we had sort of a series of questions to ponder, um, was, was like the relationship between um, like the political or social concerns of our work and the aesthetic concerns of our work and sort of how you, you know, kind of toggle between those. Is it, is it the concept? Is it the image? Uh, and for me, honestly, like without the image, without it being like a strong sculpture or what I hope is a strong sculpture, I'm not really interested in kind of pursuing the concept any farther than that. Um, so I just really wanted to make a giant flame. And even though it was rather obvious and, and not particularly subtle, um, I just kind of went straight for that big flame first. Um, and it relates to the colors and stuff and the still life work. but. Um, um, that was kind of the beginning of that series. I don't know how I ended up in that place. It started off sounding more coherent, I think. <laughs> ended, up, ended up there. Um, what else was I going to talk about? Um, I guess the idea of teaching, I think, is another thing that, uh, that is not obvious in the work, but is also important to me as, as an artist. And um, mentors of mine and people, uh, art historical influences, you know, I think I share uh, influences probably with a lot of people not just the, the ceramic artists but artists like Goya who you know you obviously can't compete with an artist like that and then even people that might be a little less obvious like Philip Gustin who are just more kind of provocateurs and uh, sort of cultural reporters in a less obvious way um, are people who have influenced me um, and then, you know, all the hundreds of artists that I uh, kind of communicate with on a daily basis um, are also kind of having their influence on me. 
Um, and, and teaching itself is a big part of sort of uh, how I think of myself um, and has become kind of a creative uh, part of my personality as well. I put quite a bit of energy into, maybe not as much as I should, sorry students back there, but <laughs> I try. Uh, try to put a lot of energy into that as well and kind of consider that uh, as important and as creative as uh, my time in this studio. And it's always a balance. I always want to be in my studio if I'm teaching. And I guess I wouldn't say I always want to be teaching when I'm in my studio. But, uh, <laughs> but if I didn't have that, I don't think that uh, I would have quite the connection to my work and sort of the connection to my community and to the world at large um, that I would have if I were simply a studio artist. Although I wouldn't mind giving it a try for, <laughs> for, for a little while. Um, I, that clearly wasn't 10 minutes, but uh, yeah. We should have lots of questions. Yeah, I'm hoping for a lot of questions. Can I pass? We'll, we'll get back to questions after. Okay, back to questions later. Can I just ask a tech? You have a piece hanging on the wall in there, and I was wondering how you have that hanging, like technically on behind it. How oh, uh, it's just like a French cleat, like screws, wood. Uh, yeah, it's just like a simple French cleat bolted in. There's like a frame on that one that I screwed into. But good question. I always want to know how to hang something. And I'm pretty bad at it, so uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hi. Um, I wanted to first say thank you to Lisa Reinertsen because this is something that's not just a little thing, okay? This is a huge thing. Okay. The one thing that I often want in my, in my exposure of my work is to be associated with people I care about and art I care about. Everything is association. So that if I'm in a show and everything is about, about honestly, about superficiality, then I'm not going to be taken too seriously when people look at my work. I mean, not that the subject would be contemporary superficiality, <laughs> but sometimes I feel like that sometimes, you know, because I'm thinking, why am I in this show? And is it, you know, is it just contemporary ceramics or is it, you know, not only a cup? <laughs> sometimes, sometimes I have a show like that, you know? And so it's really uh, refreshing to be in a show where as you enter the room, even though there's different degrees of what may be considered um, social political work, because that's a big umbrella, that at least you enter the room with a certain kind of understanding or a certain kind of posture of what, of what to, how to see when you look at everything. And so that's very, very important. And also the thing is that I think that is important is the fact that we're not all just one kind of artist, you know? It's like, I think if you are saying, well, that's a social political artist, and that's, that's, that's actually kind of two-dimensional if that's the whole sum total of of, of who you are or what your art is. And so we're actually, um, like every single one of us is like a goulash of, 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 uh, of possibly different themes, you know? Um, at least I, I see that when I look at work. And I'm also, the thing is, I, I really like, I'm really happy, not only that these are my friends, but that, that, that I really do respect their work too. So I, I'm just saying thank you, Lisa, for doing this. It's really a big deal. And I'm really super happy that it's gone three times. It's like, it was too huge. And, I, and the fact that it has is, a, is, a, is an indication of how good the show is because it just needs to be seen more as opposed to just an Enseca thing, you know? So that's, that's why I need to throw that out first. Um, I never thought of myself as a social political artist. And I still don't. I mean, that's really kind of, it's almost like if my wife was here, she'd like be rolling her eyes all over the <laughs> But, um... <laughs> oh, no. Emissary for my wife. <laughs> the, the thing is, is that, um, that I, I, what I do in my, and actually it's interesting that I'm seeing this quote, the second question about Bob Arneson saying the personal is political, and actually, Maybe that was subconscious or something, because I've always thought that myself. But he was my teacher, so maybe, yeah, he, maybe that's where it came from, you know. <laughs> but um, I think that one thing I realized is, if personally speaking, me, if I went out to pursue um, a piece of art that was going to be talking about how I feel about a certain subject or a certain aspect 
or of politics or social socio uh, uh, phenomenons in that we uh, of today, I'd fall flat on my face. It'd be so so dumb. It would like I couldn't I wouldn't even know how to begin. You know, but the thing is, is that what I what I realized if I, if the, in terms of subject matter, if I go into things that are interesting to me on a personal level, on a almost like an aha moment, like not that I have any answers, but if I there's certain questions I might I might see or or think about or I'm pondering, and if I if I'm pondering something, then that's probably worth making art about. You know, maybe it's a series of ponderances. You know, that. But if I and if I make something and and it satisfies like that, and then you throw it, put it out there, and somebody comes up and 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 you get. That's why I like going to. That's why I like. And that's why I like Kaka because people will come, approach you and talk about the work. Um, but the thing is, if they approach you and they say, they say, you know, I know nobody understands your work, but I do. <laughs> I, sometimes I get, it's like, you know, I know nobody understands that piece, but I understand it, you know? And if like eight people come up to you that day and say the same thing, then you maybe, then you're, then you're, you're hitting, you're, you're hitting a, a social level on a personal level, you know, a, it's like, if it, it's, it's, these are our personal stories, right? These aren't umbrella terms. These are, are aspects of how you feel about how this affects you. You know, when you're seeing art out there, you're seeing a person's opinion about what they think about something. It's not a generic. Hope, and if the ger and if it's generic, then you kind of like will walk right by it. You know, but it's when it, it hits you on a personal level, you're like, yeah, I get that. That's interesting. You know. With me, it's funny too because I actually intentionally don't want to have to answer. An I don't have answers, but I have a lot of questions, and so sometimes I'll put something. Or a lot of times, a real mo of my work will be they under you understand every part of it, but there's some things that you don't get. Like, and then they will say, "What? What did you? Why did you put that in there?" And honestly, a lot of times it's because I don't I don't know. I don't have an answer, so it's, it's very frustrating to come to me and ask me what that meant. Um, a good a good indication is that piece that's called Stink Eye, which actually is the newer newest piece. The other two are really old pieces. But Stink Eye is reg is the boy, the boy with the uh, the trees with the pocket knives and and that was actually something I actually pursued. I don't usually go for an actual theme or a, or a character study, and that one's like that's that's more like the the tough kid who you know you're the nice boy that ends up. The, all of a sudden, maybe due to puberty or something, now he thinks he's a badass, you know, and uh, and and he's got his pocket knife collection, and he's and he's got this almost that uh, this rose bush. Well, rose bushes are thorny, right? It's a rose bush that's upside down. That's a root system. That's his umbrella. And then there's this book, you know, he's making these two stamps. Um, the book with the two red dots. In that one, that's pretty that's pretty bloody, but sometimes they're not. And it's like this this thing. It's like motif. This this book, open book with two red dots. And people want to know what are those two red dots. And I go, well, what do you think they are? And I'll get really interesting answers. Like, oh, wow. So that's a place where the artist comes to a certain point, and then the viewer finishes it up. And coming together, there's there's. There's meaning, and the meaning has nothing to do with my intention. You know, my intention actually is often not as deep as the viewers. You know, but the thing is, is that the idea that if uh, if you put together some a sculpture in a certain manner, where you the the viewer will approach it in a certain way, and as an act of approaching, will will be coming together. Like that's what I like about Aaron Tool's work, for example, is that you pick, you know. The actual grasping of an object that you might be like, later on you can't you you can't wait to fill up and what happens when you actually drink out of this object that has that kind of imagery on it and are you are you claiming something by using a cup like that and what's happening with that you know and it's not sub, is it subconscious or is it conscious that kind of thing and I think those are the things that are really uh, exciting about when you make work um, a lot of times people will say that the work is uh, very layered. 
And it's intentionally layered in that I'm thinking about like the brand new piece that's in the, sh it's in the Natal Natula show, for example, and also the, the piece called Acid Rain here, there's a really a lot of connection, even though Acid Rain is extremely old. It's, I made that piece in 1986, you know? And a bit of DNA, that animal with the, that's, they're both 19, they're both 1986 or so. No, one's 86 and the other one's 1988. I remember actually making those. But, um, but it's all about, <laughs> <laughs> No, I actually, I mean, sometimes you make them, you don't even remember what you, you know, you don't know anything about them, but I remember actually, <laughs> I can remember back in the day, I was cutting that wood. <laughs> I had to get a new blade for the knife. You know, the thing is, is that I, I was just, I'm just going to, I just, I just wanted to say, one thing I wanted to also share with you all that, about a funny thing about, about the, the whole sociopolitical idea is, um, is how my intentions are not were in one piece was not at all interested in, in in talking about those kind of things and the piece is called that piece is the earliest one called a, a bit of dna now that piece has actually traveled a lot of, around around the country a few times and um and as as being a, a indication of, of a politically interesting work you know dna and what we think about when we see here the word dna and and uh you know uh, before OJ trial, nobody knew what, OJ, uh, what, what DNA was. Now everybody, now it's like, now it's in your lexicon, right? But before that, people, you know, what is DNA? And, uh, and when I went to high school, I, I went to Christian Brothers High School in Sacramento, and I had an excellent education. Um, I took all these science classes. As a matter of fact, they didn't have any art. You just had science and math. <laughs> Not very fun, but I got a good education. The thing, the thing is, is that I learned a lot of stuff that I knew I was never going to use. You know, when are you going to use that, right? And I learned about the DNA molecule and the parts of an atom and the parts of a cell and that kind of stuff. I'm going, I'm never going to. And then I said, DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. When am I going to use that? And so I thought, well, I'm going to put it in my art. <laughs> I'm going to do it. I'm going to call it a bit of DNA. And that way I can say, well, at least I used it. <laughs> you know? And, uh, and so the, and so I had fun with it because it's a DNA molecule on this thing, and and this, and I always was making kind of amorphous, kind of shapes, animalistic things. So that was a natural go-to, and then the antlers or whatever this thing was was kind of a, these the plastic thing is, a takeoff on the DNA molecule as well. And that was the long and short of it, you know, and so the thing is is that. And then people would come up and say, what's DNA? Well, I said, well, you know, when I was in high school, I'd tell the story, right? And now, and then, but time has gone by, and now it's considered like a very important piece. <laughs> Who knew? Well, now you guys know. So the thing is that acid rain is more of an idea of like just more of a really innocent, I mean, these are two figures that are very innocent looking, right? Kind of young kids. And But one's a little animal guy, and they're both like, and, and I thought, it's just like a passing kind of like, scary idea was like, what if acid rain really was acid when it rained? What, it was, what if it was really raining acid? So that's a scary thought, right? And so this piece is more about, you know, that's why the boat is skeletal and, and the water, even the water has holes in it, you know? But uh, also when I think about it, I'm thinking about the composition so that from across the room you'll see, you don't see all that stuff when across the room. When you see, Across the room, you'll see this shape, this shape, and this shape, and that I think the compositions, interesting compositions, is what brings you across the room to look closer. And it's when you look closer that hopefully you're sharing something more in whatever manner. You know, now that I have your attention, what is what what is the piece saying? You know. Anyways, so I just wanted to end up with that. Okay, thanks. You may have noticed that a lot of us are starting by thanking Lisa. Um, and that's because we have watched her on a hero's journey. She has worked with um, three different bureaucratic structures and um, doing things that a lot of artists work very hard not to get involved with. And we have all been the beneficiary. I do want to say, Lisa, that please at some point on this panel talk about your work. because. Yeah. 
um, it has been a great guiding inspiration for me for decades, and so um, we need to hear about that. Um, so let me just kind of start. Uh, I'm going to go talk briefly about graduate school, because if you could survive that, chances are you're going to be strong. Um, I had a pretty tough graduate school experience, and I remember one party where all the professors were sitting around and the, and the students, and somebody kind of artificially came up with the idea, what is the purpose of art? And we all began our, you know, we were kind of, it was just literally down the couch, and, and everybody had an explanation which remarkably reflected their own work. Um, so somebody who was doing non-objective, uh, one-color field painting would talk about flatness and how significant that was. And it got to me, and I just simply said, to save the world. And they all moved away from me <laughs> and continue to do so. And so I just, I just realized this has brought that, that memory back to me. Um, but I do want to say I am so honored to be in this company. These people have been so inspirational to me, and it reminds me of a fabulous essay by T.S. Eliot, who talked about the role of a masterpiece and, and your, how he's really writing to writers about how to become a great writer. And he says, start by identifying your masterpieces, the things that you admire and love. And Arthur does something with his students that I've stolen with my students. You make them all do a, a, like a notebook, and you did it for yourself, right? All the pieces you admire. And you think about, you want, you don't want to copy these things, but you want your piece to fit comfortably in that company. And that's what T.S. Eliot said, is that you want to make work so that it'll, it'll be strong enough to move up into that realm of masterpiece and push everybody, kind of make more room for you. And you're, then there's a family of these, and you're part of the family. And Lisa, by including me in this, has put me, uh, I've, I've admired and been inspired by my friend and, and mentor, Dick Notkin, for decades. And, and Lisa and Arthur, I think, I think Arthur's work I can't. I think there could be a novel written about every one of his pieces, and I would so love to read that entire series, right? <laughs> and 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 Aaron has inspired me in so many ways um, that I don't even know how to um, to speak of. So anyway, it's such, so great to actually have my work put into the company of the people I admire. So. Um, Let's see, uh, I just, I was gonna, was that, oh yeah, oh that's right. So let me tell you, yeah, I, I've got some pieces in the show. I, I gotta tell you, the, the thing that is most animating to me is getting myself out of control in the studio. I, I have learned this postgraduate school that it is really important for me not to know what's going on. And I get the role of mystery. How do you surprise yourself in the studio? Because I learned through a, a number of mishaps that when I don't know what's going on in my work, it gets a lot better. When my work looks like something I intended, it's not nearly as strong as when it, it, it emerges and I'm kind of participating in something bigger than me. And so I have developed all these tactics to surprise myself as I work. And the large piece, Dave, and the little piece, Tis of Thee, come from my most recent series of figures that, um, that emerge from this idea. So I start, I just start with all kinds of textured slabs and I throw, I have trays of forms that I throw on the wheel and I have extruded, trays of extruded forms and I just line them all up and then I start building and I build and I coil and I build and I kind of create these kind of rotting pieces of architecture that kind of just emerge and develop and, and grow and then at some time I know it's going to be figure because I love, I've, I got to do figure so I'm working to get this, this figure starts to emerge. And when I get to the figure, I know where I'm going. And that's a problem. So I grab a hunk of extrusion and I just slam it in there. And now I don't know anymore and I have to make sense of it. And so I, I, I struggle and I make sense of it. And then, uh-oh, I know what's going on again. So I grab a slab and I throw it up there. And I say, well, that's the wrong way to say that. But I put it up there. And, and I'm, I'm out of control again and I have to make sense of it. And that kind of, that's one of the techniques I've come up with to surprise myself. So how does that become social conscious? Because that's really how those pieces emerged. 
And, and the fact is, you all are socially conscious. And when I allow myself to surprise myself, it also allows, in order to do that, you have to trust yourself in the studio. And graduate school teaches you so many things that I'm not dissing graduate school is a very important rite of passage and a growth for me. But, or however, and the, the reality is it took me about five to 10 years after graduate school to begin to trust myself in the studio. And when I could, all the things that I feel about the world around me were invited into the work. And they emerged in a so much more humorous and meaningful and powerful way than they had when I was intending to say something. And that's where Dave and, and Tiz of Thee, they come about, they kind of taught me what they were about. And I think what their central feeling for me is, is that we all are made up of all the things we do in the world, right? So the things, in, I don't know how, but the things that, um, like, I would, I would guarantee you that each one of us is carrying just a little piece of Dow Chemical in us right now, right? A little bit of Monsanto. We got it in us, right? And boy, if you weren't socially conscious before November 16th, you've got to be now. And if you're not, you are really not paying attention, right? So, so. If you're trusting yourself in the studio, this, this kind of work, for me, has always naturally emerged. And I've always been, since, since a child, and this is something I, I share with Dick Notkin. He and I talked about this extensively. And that is, um, I was raised in a Jewish tradition. And for reasons that I think are probably deeply wrong, um, at about third grade, I was exposed to the ideas of the Holocaust. I mean, I was shown those pictures of the piles of shoes and the emaciated figures. I was in third grade. And I think my, my questioning of authority and my deep, profound understanding of, of the, the Goethe quote, which says, um, by the slightest alteration of my character, I would be capable of any act, that has always informed my artwork ever since this kind of investigation of who we are as human beings and what we do. So perhaps I can find something uplifting to say at some point here. Um, let's I'll just kind of finish up with the concept of legacy, because um, I really think as artists, we're the last ones to consult on what our legacy is, right? Um, but I'm very proud of something I teach in school, and I learned it by teaching, which is appreciation is the vital component in, I teach creative strategy and process, but I really teach appreciation as well because I tell my students, and some of you are here and you'll, this will sound familiar, we are only capable of appreciating, of, of creating, we're only capable of creating to the depth that we can appreciate. So that's, that's so true for me. And that teaching has been such a privilege because it has taught me to appreciate deeply. And as I look around this audience, I mean, I'm very confused about, you know, who's on the panel here, because I look and I see these magnificent people who have inspired me. We got John Toki and Ryan Hurst and Lisa Clegg and Bill and Claudia, and I could go on, I could name a lot. I, I know you're out there. And you have been so profoundly moving to me. And, and I have learned I mean, I literally feel sometimes looking at your work that I am lifted. And I think, here's one thing I also tell my students that when they make art, even if I never see it, if they go off somewhere and they make art, my world is improved. And all of your worlds are improved by everything we see here. So I'll, I'll leave it for there for now and thanks for being here. I make cups. <laughs> can we hear from do we have a make him talk <laughs> alright well that was the first that's the last that's all the rest of this is kind of uh, extra I just make cups um 
we're thanking Lisa and Pence and everybody here, but also the audience. You know, there's no difference between my cups and the plastic cups unless, you know, somebody picks it up and is like, oh my God. You know, I think one of the most, oh, can we swear? Anyway, one of the most, uh, there's a four letter word that rhymes with truck. And I was talking to this, he was a, a corpsman, a Navy corpsman. The Marine Corps doesn't have medics, it was a Navy corpsman. And he said he was, a, he was a combat medic in the Korean War. And I said, oh, four letter word that rhymes with truck. And he said, yeah, four letter word that rhymes with truck. And that was the most articulate conversation I've ever had about war. That like, we understood, you know? And so that's the thing with the cups. A lot of people with the cups, they look at them, they're like, yeah, whatever, it's a cup. There's no difference, but some people pick them up and are like, four-letter word that rhymes with truck, you know. So, so it's it's the it's the generosity of the audience that that listens, that looks, that takes the time, you know, in this digital, you know, clickbait world, that somebody looks at it and cares enough to think about it, is the generosity. And if there is any magic in what I make, that's where it comes from, is is the audience and. Whatever, right? I was in the Marine, I joined the Marine Corps, right? And it was an intention. It used to be called, the military used to be called the service, right? And so I still have that desire to serve. I want to do something, right? The Marine Corps locate, close with, and destroy the enemy by fire and maneuver, right? But now, like as an artist, locate, close with, and destroy the enemy through empathy and education and understanding and sharing and, you know, just being part of this community is just amazing. Like, if, you know, I tell students, if you don't have to make art, don't. Go get a day job and, you know, but if you do have to make art, then suck it up, take your lumps, and it's going to be a great, you know, the community is, is you know, my paycheck or my, uh, you know, my bank account is kind of pathetic, but, like, I live a rich, <laughs> there isn't anything more I want in the world except security, and money won't buy that either, you know. Uh, so I just make cups. Got out of the Marine Corps, my first instructor, a Japanese-American, raised in internment camps, said all art's political. I went to Alfred, I checked out Alfred, and a woman there said, you're not making art, you're, you're doing journalism. So, I don't know. I just make, you know, if you're a painter and painting's dead, it sucks to be you, but it doesn't mean you should be making crappy videos, you know? I think your <laughs> obligation as a human is to do what you're called to do, if that's, you know, orthodon ortho 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 yeah, orthodontia, <laughs> or cups, or whatever. <laughs> is that enough? I'm done, right? Yeah. <laughs> Listening to and responding to some of the things that um, um, for me, the idea of uh, personal as political, um, I didn't mean that to be an Arneson quote, it's just a quote I've heard. But also the idea that the per if, you, if you express your, your personal truth, then it's your best chance at expressing something that's also universal truth. You can't guess, you can't say, well, I'm, I think there's this truth out here, it's not personal to me, but I'm gonna guess what this is and try to express it, and people aren't gonna, you know, it's not gonna resonate. Um, so I, so for me that, um, those of you that think it's a mystery that I invited you into this show, I, you know, I, you know I, I love the work of all the artists in this show deeply and it's moved me and um, you know, I, I, I'm sure I could tell you, Arthur, things that to me reflect, you know, if you're speaking to your, your experience and the things that intrigue you in this world and you're responding to it, it's, you know, maybe, well, that's why I said social consciousness a little more than uh, political um, yeah. as the definition, because um, I think people do resonate and they have their own responses. Um, and yeah, your intention may not be at all to be political. And the same with Richard Shaw. I will have to say, when I um, met with him before the first uh, sh exhibition, and we went out to lunch with um, him and his wife and his grandson. And uh, Mary Shaw looks at me and says, so what is this show about, Lisa? And I said, well, it's um, the legacy of social consciousness. And she said, Richard doesn't have social consciousness. <laughs> and, and I'm sure that he doesn't see himself that way, and she certainly didn't. 
But to me, when I look at the, the, the trompe l'oeil work that he does, and there's just this l undercurrent of humor, of observation of sort of the human condition, and that reflects upon this, our social, you know, cultural world that we live in. And, you know, I look at that piece with the boat. Um, you know, there's these books. There's, uh, that's actually why I put it on the cover of the book, because I thought people, you know, and maybe it's a more subtle piece about social consciousness, but, um, and you can go see it in there, but, you know, there's this boat that's made out of folded money, and, you know, there's that lovely blue, uh, it's like a sort of an Italian covering from an old book, but that becomes the sea, and this boat is sinking, and, you know, so there's layers of meaning there that you can read into, you know, what you want, but there's definitely some sort of comment he's making, uh, you know, uh, about our world with that piece. And so to me, and I think in some ways that's the beauty of, um, of pulling people into this show under this umbrella of this theme, uh, because a lot of it is very subtle and, and some of it, like Notkins, is really in your face. He's always been very, very political with his work and wants to speak to issues of war. and. Um, you know, and Aaron, your work too, it's, it, you know, it's very clearly, um, you know, speaking to that as, as protest, really. Um, but it, anyway, so there, and, and um, Michelle Greger's work also, um, you know, there was that question, her, it's so subtle and so beautiful, but the empowerment of the scout figure and the name scout, I mean, there's this very strong, powerful woman that's leading and moving forward. Um, the two women lovers piece is just so elegant and powerful. Um, so in, in, again, in a really subtle way, um, there's something she's saying uh, about women and that I think uh, you feel it. And I think that's how a lot of this work is, is that it, it's kind of uh, subversive because it doesn't just literally say this is what we believe. I've often said I, I make this art, I, I can back, back up a little and say, I grew up with a family of activists. Um, my dad marched with Martin Luther King. My parents were on the board of the Sacramento Peace Center for 10 years. So that activism is really in my back of my, you know, mind as an artist. Um, oh, I got off on what I was, I had this great point I was gonna make. Um, oh, it's the, oh, the, um, just the, the um, subversive nature, I, I, I don't, even though I grew up around that, I hate verbal confrontation. It, it stresses me out, you know. And so I don't really want to get in an argument with people about politics or about environmental justice or about women's issues. Um, but if I make this art and I just put it how, how it feels to me out there, and, and, and like you guys, I don't necessarily think I have this end goal. I want to say this message at all. You know, I, I have this feeling, I do sketches, and I kind of say, oh, this, piece, this sketch and this idea is kind of resonating with me. I'm not sure why. I'm going to follow that for a while and see where it goes. And often it's as I'm working on it, I start thinking, oh, and this kind of is making me think about this. And, you know, it starts to kind of gel what, it, what I think it's about. Um, and then someone will come along and think it's about something completely different. It's like, oh, that, that's really interesting. But, but I do think that through art, yeah, uh, you can pull people in with the beauty, the composition, and then there's this sort of subversive, and which is why I think most of the artists in the show, like, what, why are you, I don't want to talk about what there might be as a meaning behind this, you know, just let that be a subtle thing that people will get or they won't get or, you know, whatever the feeling is. So, um, and I, I will also say, because I share, the, the same feeling that there are definitely people here in this audience. The first round of this show, I proposed to the MCCA in Portland, and they said the group shows can have 10 people in them. And I was like, oh my God, I don't know how to do this. You know, because, but, and, and as you said, like all of us have social consciousness and we bring whatever, you know, I mean, um, we bring ourselves to our work and sometimes that's gonna come into it and sometimes it's not. Um, but certainly um, there's, you know, a, a lot of amazing artists in this room that bring, you know, so much meaning to their work, and I wish you guys could all be in the show, too. So I want, I guess my apologies, <laughs> my apologies to the, no, to those who didn't, who are, could be in this show. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, so I just wanted to kind of give some response to that.
question about how literal, you know, I, I didn't, um, I, I'm glad that uh, it's not all literal. <laughs> Oh, anyway, I'm grab it from Lisa. Okay, there you go. <laughs> because I know people want to hear her talk a little bit about her own work. I just want to oh. turn it back to you. We did a whole show four years ago about Lisa's passion for for animals and our responsibility for um, caretaking for different animals. And you can see her newest work. Um, it's it's a theme that really resonates with you. So could you talk a little bit about what your passion is? Well, um, I will start with saying I. Um, I've been working with images of animals and humans <coughs> probably since I was a kid because I would draw my own animals and my own family members and um, um, so it's in some ways you kind of rehash a lot of the same ideas. Um, the, the show I did at the Pence really, you know it's funny because when I was in graduate school there really was this sense that you can't do li you know really obvious political work because that's just propaganda that's like you know Russian socialism or you know uh, Soviet Union socialism, sorry, um, and and there was really you know pushback, and because I was you know wanting to do stuff that was a little more obvious, um, and so there was probably a lot more subtlety um, to what I was kind of putting into my work in my earlier work, but I came to the point where you know I really um, I'm personally extremely uh, terrified and disturbed by what's happening to our environment. And I feel like it, it's, it's urgent, it's a crisis, and I'm aware of the threat of extinction uh, to so many animals. And so, uh, you know, I mean, I can send money to different causes, and I do some of that, but um, I just, you know, for this show, I decided to kind of focus more directly on how that, what that feels to me. Um, and each piece is maybe a little different. Um, take on that and again not necessarily so literal but maybe more emotional like I, I want I want people to feel the grief of that um, and maybe that's uh, really what was coming through with the recent work for that show so I'll leave it at that okay. and I think with that we're gonna open it up for questions and I'm wondering maybe if we could form a line behind the microphone just so we can get your questions um, on the mic um, well hopefully we'll hear them do we have anyone who would love to ask a question of a particular artist or to the whole group? And then we'll see who is going to respond. Anyone? You must have burning questions. <laughs> we talk a lot. <laughs> smoldering. Come on, some of the students. Oh, good. Yay, first person. How you guys doing? <laughs> so my question is to everyone. As artists, we get a lot of conflicting ideas on maybe what's working, what's not working. And then as a creator, you have your own idea on what maybe you're going for. How do you reconcile that outside influence, uh, take part of it, and then you know, what do you leave behind? Which one of us? Okay. Uh, I would say consider yourself lucky that people are giving you feedback about your work. That's one of the uh, that's one of the joys of being a student is that people are, are going to engage with you on that level, and you're with a peer group that whose real mission is to kind of engage with those issues and kind of battle through like what's important and what's not important and what's yours and what's not yours. And um, as you kind of move past that experience, you just don't, you have less of that experience. You know, I'll have sometimes similar conversations with friends and peers, but it's much rarer. So um, I would say, you know, I'm not directly responding to your question, but just to say you're lucky and to kind of value that experience and it'll edit itself out. It might seem like you don't know what to make one month it doesn't matter, this is a long, long game that you're in and what makes sense one year might not make sense two years later. Um, so you just have to take that all in and kind of filter through it and edit it out and find your own way. So it'll, if, as long as you're making work, you're, it'll resolve itself, you'll, you'll figure it out, but you just have to keep making stuff um, and it'll, it'll work its own way through. I don't know if that was a fairly direct. 
Yeah, great question, and I, I really want to agree with working and working, and then when you're done with that, keep working. Uh, Rilke, the, the, the great poet, uh, Rainier Marie Rilke, said, consider yourself right in all things. Just kind of... <laughs> Just start with that. And he goes on, fortunately, you know, you, he, don't stop reading there, keep going. Because what he says is, if you work with integrity, if you're wrong, you'll figure it out. But just like you heard in Monica's comments, you ha you're the core and you're lucky that people are giving you input and advice and guidance. But like I do a lot of assemblage and I jump into the dumpster and I get stuff, really good stuff, but I don't take it all because there's a lot of stuff in there I don't want, but I get the good stuff. And when people give you comments, there will be stuff that you know, there's stuff that, that is really loving and wonderful and there's stuff that's not so good. Um, and some of the, the stuff that's hard to hear, you know in your heart is you need to listen. But at the same time, it's all you, you're in charge. You don't have to take, you leave a lot of stuff in the dumpster, right? Um, I, my response to that is that um, aside for, take everything, take everything under advisement. Every, no, matter, no matter how highly the respected voice that's commenting on your work, take that under advisement. Don't take it as what you need or need, not, need to do or not to do, you know, because you're the, you're the artist. You're the person that's going to be assessed by another opinion. And it's all, it's all important to, you know, you, and you're the, you're the person who's using your time making things. So, you know, you, you know what feels good and what doesn't feel good. And you, I think one thing is that we, one, thing, one way that we're all different is that we have a different process. We have a different procedure in how we think art practices. And so I think it's the, Sometimes the hardest thing is to understand what art practice means. You know, what does it mean to go into your studio and then once you're in studio, what are you actually doing? You know, what are you doing? Like, how do you, what's your first physical step towards, towards doing something, you know, in your, and what's your procedure? And your procedure is probably, I don't know, maybe I could go as far as say our procedures are unique, you know. Um, you know, and I think the thing is, is that we're trying to figure it out. I go in my studio, I'm trying to figure it out. I... I think I need to figure it out every single time. I think if I have a set way of being too, if it's too calcified, too concretized, too s the same, then it's just going to be, I'm, I'm going to make things by rote, you know. And I like to think of myself as an explorer, you know, somebody who's investigating. You know, when you read artist statements, <laughs> the, first st the first almost cliche statement to, the first sentence that all uh, artist statements is like, my investigation is, <laughs> you know, we're all investigators, right? <laughs> and so, so the thing is, is that I think you have to find out what it is, what does that mean? What is, what is, what is it you're trying to go for? And, and, and also one thing I think about too, when I'm thinking about my work, is that I think, okay, my work is all about these things. And oh, those are good, I'm thinking of myself as a symbolist. So, oh, that's a good, that, that's a good thing to use for, th that'll mean this to me, and that'll mean that to me. But, if I don't enjoy making those things, if I don't go to the studio and like have fun making those things, then it's, then it's another job and it's like I may as well be mowing the lawn or something like that because it's just not fun and not exploring. So I think basically what you should do is just pay attention as you're making your art, pay attention to how, how you're proceeding. It's almost like you have to watch yourself, you know, be objective and subjective back and forth, you know. So, and then you just, and then you do, you weed it out and you figure it out. You kind of say, oh, that, I'm not really interested in doing that anymore. You know, you come to those points where you kind of say, that's, I'm done with that. And th it'll go and it'll be replaced by something. What am I going to replace it with? What's, and then you go out and hit the pavement, you know, check it out. You know, that kind of thing. It's all a process. There's no real answer. It's just, just finding out what, you know, what, who you are. You know, and that's not even a deep thing to say. It's like we're all trying to just, just trying to get ourselves, you know, and then hopefully somebody else will say, "Oh, you know, my doppelganger." You, <laughs> you know, you, it's like you, you'll find your clan. You know, that's the cool thing. All right. Mm -hmm.
<laughs> Mark, 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 Mark. Well, I have a question for you. <laughs> <laughs> My question is, why are you picking on me? <laughs> <laughs> oh, here. Uh, I have a question for, uh, think for you, Lisa, and it's about curation. Uh, I'm wondering, like I think a lot about um, exemplars. Do you want to go to the mic? Because we won't hear it on the video. Thank you. Oh, right. Uh, so my question is for you, Lisa. I uh -huh. think a lot about like exemplars of works, uh, sharing that with students. And when I look around the gallery, I, I try to, I see them all as exemplars. But when you're choosing pieces or you're making decisions about what to include in a show, is there, are there any sort of uh, criteria or sort of mystical uh, content or, or things that you are drawn to that, you, that maybe make you select what you select? Well, first I want to say that um, I don't really see myself as a curator. I'm an artist that, you know, wanted to organize this exhibition and make it happen. Okay. Um, and then once I show up to galleries, they say, you're the curator, Lisa. And it's like, oh, I guess I am, right. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so I, I, you know, first I want to say it was really just, this is a story I wanted to tell and share. Um, so under the umbrella of the topic that I, and the, and the story of, it's of the community, of the history, of the legacy, of the social consciousness. Um, then when I went to talk, to, I think, you know, in some ways I asked the artists what they thought they would like to put in the show. I, it's hard to even remember exactly the process. Um, and then I also had pieces that I'd said, you know, I'd seen and um, that made me want to bring their work into the show. Um, so it was really just, you know, kind of a dialogue. And there was a little back and forth about um, what pieces were coming into the show. But I think mostly, um, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I mostly let you guys guide uh, what you put in the show. I just, you know, I selected them as, as the artists and um, gave them, you know, sort of the idea of, okay, under, under this theme, um, yeah, I mean, actually, with with Monica, I'd seen the the series of your wall pieces with all the animals, and of course, you know, I had a reaction that may not have been her intention of the meaning of the work. I saw a more environmental kind of thing there, um, and and then she said, "Oh, I have all this new work." I, you know, well, yeah, we can put one of those in, but I, <laughs> you know, can I please put some new work in? Cool. So, you know, it's like, okay, let me come to your house and see your work. And I did visit, I did studio visits with several of the artists too. Some of you guys already knew your work for a long time. Wan Xing, I went to his studio and he's a little tricky because he's got galleries that sell his work in San Francisco and, you know, like, will it still, will it still be here? And he's actually changed out his pieces because things have sold. Oh, um, wow. So, you know, so there's some new pieces in the show this time. This Actually, this third incarnation has... Um, Monica has a new piece. I have a new piece. Mark has a new piece. Um, I'm not sure if there's any others, but uh, well, yeah, actually, Aaron has made new pieces uh, for every single time. He has thrown new cups for these shows, which is really uh, wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Great. I think that's a good point of, um, yeah, you pick the artists and trust them. That, I mean, and again, it was just this show, and I don't intend to continue curating. <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I like to be an artist. Yeah, <laughs> so, great. But, yeah. yeah, well, thank you very much. Okay, that helped. I'm glad you mentioned an artist, too. Yeah. That's a good question. Yes. Aaron, my question's for you. I hear you like to make coffee mugs? Uh, cups. Cups? What? Well, whiskey, whiskey, whiskey and beer. Um, I've heard about you for a while, and I've heard your story. I'd like you to, could you please explain me why you make cups and a little bit about your history and your purpose? I mean, I've heard some interesting things about you, but I've never had the opportunity to hear, talk to you before. Uh, so please. Wow. Thanks. What was the question? Why do you make cups? <laughs> Just cups. Really it's a mental illness now. I'm, I'm willing to admit now it's a mental illness that, that the desire to make cups, like, 
uh, you know, the longer, whatever, I, like watch the news and they start getting all fidgety. And, well, are and you a veteran? Too. I mean, you have some war Once experience? Rain, always, uh, I mean, is that what caused you? I mean, I heard something about that. You're, it's, you're, um, I mean, I, I heard just bits and pieces. You're not comfortable talking about it? That's okay, yeah, no, too. I mean, I was in the 91 Gulf War. I was a Marine for five years. Well, I guess once, in, whatever. Uh, yeah, that, that's what started it. And it was, that person was political. My first, Ben Sakaguchi, Japanese-American, said all art's political. And, you know, if it fits in a bank lobby, that's not a neutral space. Your work is, is like propping up the the bank or you know it, it, it's not in it doesn't fight the bank it supports the anyway I don't know but and two like I, I think part of the thing maybe is really I'm just a straight up coward like going to art school and like you know putting the same images on a six by six canvas would be like a lot you know to like to try to defend and you know what are you doing and yeah that same that same thing with like why you know this is this is propaganda this is too didactic it's too political but my thing is, is like if you're making a gas mask for kids, like a toy GI Joe gas mask for kids ages six and up, you have no idea what that is about. You have no idea what mustard gas, or whatever. You, just, you know, you're making war toys, toys for kids. You don't. Yeah, that's as abstract as an ink blot. It means nothing to you if you would give that to a six-year-old kid. So, whatever. But so then putting that on a canvas for me is too much. Putting it on a cup, <laughs> you know, nobody cares about a cup. It's it's not. And even the cups in the show, like there's the other side to the cup that you don't see. And I don't know, I'm just more comfortable with that scale. Like even this is really awkward for me. Like being on this side of the table, we should be sitting at the table drinking. That's where the good right, whiskey, conversations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, that's where the good conversations come up. And, and it's like, anyway, so the cup, and then again, it's not my story. It's like you take those cups back into your life and somebody that you already love and trust you know, they recognize a refugee or a veteran. They re they recognize what those images are, and they share a story with you that maybe doesn't come up otherwise. Like, so. I hear you give them away free. Is that true? Yeah, I'm I'm coming up on uh, well, I'm over twenty thousand. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Hey, thank you. Thanks, huh? Got to do something with your day. I want to actually respond to that. Um, you know, I, I have a couple of a couple of his cups, and I find that they, they the whole idea of when you have a work in a gallery, you know, again, you have a certain kind of behavior, and also people, you know, people go into galleries who choose to go into galleries because they know they're going to see art, and you're of a certain ilk. And but if you have if you have these cups, they go outside into the real world, and uh, and other people who don't know anything about art will be, if they come to my house, they might grab one and they'll go, what the hell is this? <laughs> Maybe. Or they'll say, whoa, that kind of thing. And, they, and they're out of the gallery situation and they're in the real world. And they have a certain kind of honesty. That's when honesty takes a huge leap from, from being on a shelf in there and going into the, into the, you know, the prosaic world that becomes profound, actually. So I, I think that that's, that's a device that, that, is, that is there that is between the table and the wall, perhaps, right? What so, yeah. You may not be there to get the praise, but it's out, you know. So just, like, be patient. Uh, could I ask uh, Mark to step up to the mic? Because I, I, I'd like to ask him a question, um, if that's <laughs> possible. Uh, right with a, right with a truck. Folks, <laughs> so Mark no. Messenger is the it, uh, the creator of that um, the the intimate piece in the in the tower glass tower there, and. I really, quite sincerely, when, every time I see that piece, I have two reactions. One is, oh, my God. I mean, that's a, like a two-year journey. And the courage, the commitment, the respect for Lisa's project, the, 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 you know, I've known Mark's work for years, and that is literally about four times more than any piece I've ever seen in terms of just the, the heroic effort that he put in. And I want to talk about what that, I want you to talk about what that experience was. The other thing that comes through is some of those images on there are really hard. 
<laughs> and, you know, working that hard for two years and the courage to put some of those images down on that space, any of that strikes commentary from you, I'd love to hear it. I talk with all of you guys at different times. And you can you louder. hear? You talk louder so they can, can you hear me? He's, he's hearing you, but you have to speak louder. Okay. So, yeah. so it'll be really screechy there, and you'll hear me. Yeah. All right. Um, I talk with all of you and uh, have, formally, informally, and all the rest. It was a big, um, how do you say it? It helped me uh, keep energy and focus because of talking with Lisa and the show was coming up. It was coming up for a long time, remember? And so, and I didn't even make the first go of the show because I just, well, I can't do it which surprised me. It was the biggest underestimation of my, overestimation of my life, you know? But anyways, with that said, knowing everybody's work, how do you like say I'm part of this group and not try to put your best foot forward? <laughs> it's a profound group. Anyways, um, yeah, uh, I, I, I plead guilty to that. I'm just electronically, yeah, impaired, yeah. Um, Carl, my teaching partner, said all the images came out really fast and easy. It was almost like a flow of consciousness. It was the two years it took putting them down and making them right. Yeah. It's a, it, I, g I do great sketchbooks, mm -hmm. and I'm pretty sure about certain things, but then it takes a long time to put it on. Mm -hmm. The most exciting thing I just heard was I see a series of canvases that are like 8 by 10 with Aaron Toole making images on canvas. <laughs> <laughs> I will volunteer to do the canvases for Aaron Tool. <laughs> that would be amazing. Would that be an amazing show to see? Yeah. Uh, ca all canvases <laughs> of Aaron Tool, like cups, like just blow them up, man. Make them huge and two-dimensional. Blow them up, I've shot them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right, you could do that too. I. The, the the things that are all our contents are so intimate, and it's almost the stuff you can't bring up in public. You can't talk about. You know, it's like politics, you know, art and this and that, you know, whatever. It, there are things that mean a lot to everyone, but you can't even talk about it to some friends. I have a lot of really cool, lovely redneck friends that I can't talk about certain things. Um, just can't. Yeah. Because they lost a son in a war, and I can't talk about political stuff with them or something like that. Um, <laughs> thank you for talking to him last night, Aaron. <laughs> um, and some of those things none of us can really talk about. They come out in our art. And damn the torpedoes, right? You know, that's the one place where you can actually say some stuff. And that's my two cents. Thank you. Sorry, thanks. No, it's good. We g the gallery and I got the most questions about Mark's piece. It's, it was, there, I mean, it's huge. It's really impressive. But there's so much narrative going on in there. And there's so much symbolism. And people really wanted to know the answers. You know, what do the numbers mean? Or what do the gold dots mean? Or what are, you know. And I, when you were there to answer some of them, you often would just try to ask what do you think? You know, what does it, it mean to you? But um, anyway, it, it's a really powerful piece in many ways, uh, not just the scale. Uh, and we all know the daunting uh, undertaking of physically making that happen. Uh, the engineering of that, um, it was amazing. But, um, you know, in the end, it, it's the piece itself and the images. <clears throat> and I don't know <coughs> excuse me, how many people realize that, but. Um, it's two hands, that big giant piece in there. Um, <clears throat> some people s would see it, and because there's so much imagery, uh, some people didn't see the overall form of these two hands. Uh, and it's titled Cliffhanger. Um, so, you know, one hand is grasping the other hand from, sorry, I'm, I'm literally describing this. But, um, <laughs> sorry. But I think um, there were a lot of people who didn't see that uh, about that piece. So if you didn't catch all of the, 
layers of that piece. Um, it, it's really an amazing tour de force, and I'm really appreciative that you pulled that off to be in this exhibition twice now. <laughs> so, thank you. So. Hi, yeah, I was uh, thinking about protest art and uh, murals like uh, Diego Rivera, things like that, and art in the 60s, similar types of murals, and I was wondering, what do you think will be, looking back, what do you think will be the kind of the protest art of this Trump era? What do you see as kind of, if you can forecast it, what would you see as that? What do you think will come out of this context and what art will be made? You know, I, I, I'm, I, of course, I have no idea. But the thing is, is that um, one thing I do, like, that kind of like irks me about the whole thing is, and I, then as, as it irks me, I kind of understand it at the same time, is that how much art has been used with his image? I mean, his image is so pervasive that I don't think he deserves it. You know, it's like he, you want to protest him, at, you know, don't include him in any of your art. You know, talk about something else that that is perhaps a consequence of his actions, but not just making fun of his hair and, and that kind of stuff. I think that's very superficial and makes it easy to excuse the work. I, some, I mean, and I, but I also, at the same time, I see it as a catharsis, how you, you want to say, you know, I, wanna, I, you know, I hate the guy, I hate what, I, I hate his behavior, and, or whatever it is that your comments about him is, is that, you need to talk about the things he would rather not you talk about, not making cartoons of his, of his, of his appearance. I think that's, I think that's a waste of time, honestly. And, you know, yeah. Donald. Um, I, I have a, 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 a clear idea about this because Donald is the death of all civility. He's, just, he's, he's an exemplar of why we have the values we have, why we hold the convictions we have. And I would say that every work of art is an effective protest. It's, it's an act of civility and grace and beauty. Claudia Carrara's art is is, a, is going to be a long-lasting protest of Donald. Bill Abright's, John Tokey's art is going to be deeply moving and meaningful in the wake of the blip that was this monster, right? Jack Russell's art will always stand as a commentary to the grace and civility of those of us who care enough about humanity to create. Boy, listen to me. He gets me a little Yeah, right. I like to I like to ask a little question of Aaron. Years ago there was a Nsika um event in which you were an emerging artist and um, you had a display of um, cups on the wall. And I was checking it out, and there was a video that went along with it. And so I'm looking at these cups on the wall, and I realized that a lot of the cups have been shot, and they're broken cups. And along with the description of what they were all about, and please help me remember this, Aaron, four cups or six cups were like a squad, and then 40 cups were a something else, some other measure of men that would go out on a, an event. Um, and then you got to the platoon. And then the video is shooting the cups. So each one of these cups on the wall that were set up either as a squad or a company or a platoon were uh, enhanced by a gun going off and the cup being shattered and broken. And so when you say you just make cups, you make cups that are about people, about people that have been lost, about people that serve, about cups that have been broken, or at least that's what you've conveyed to me about it. And so 
more than it, you know, and I know all of these artists for a long time, and I've seen Arthur's work and Monica's and, and so on, but I've never been impacted so much uh, socio-politically uh, by an anti-war statement uh, as your cups at that event and your continuance of making cups. And you say, oh, I just make cups, which simplify things too much. And so on your behalf, I, I think that you make cups about people, about loss, about love, um, and about war, and activity, and action, and anti-war uh, in, in one of the most profound ways I've ever seen. So I just wanted to add that wow. to the event. That was generous. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think part of the thing for me with when I say I just make cups is a self-protection thing, right? I joined the Marine Corps for all kinds of good and noble intentions, but the gap between the stated goal and the outcome was kind of vast and tragic. And so, so uh, saying I just make cups is, is kind of just like for my own mental health, right? Like, I want it to be all the things you said, but I can't, I can't invest in that. Like, I, I just out of... Uh, cowardice or something I'm afraid that maybe it's not true you know anyway so so I just make cups and yeah I want to talk about all those things but it's you know it's uh, shoot, I can't talk without crying sort of toot their own horn or spell out this is why I do this or this is what this means. Um, and so I'm really grateful that you were speaking on the behalf of Aaron. And I guess for me, pulling these people into this umbrella, this idea was also a way for me to sort of speak on their behalf to what, you know, they don't want to all come out and say uh, how social or political. And, and I, I think political, you know, some artists, certainly it's political and some artists I would keep the social consciousness more of the idea, but um, but I think, you know, in some ways I had the same feeling, you know, can I just, you know, put you under this umbrella and speak on your behalf of what I feel um, is within the work of this group of artists. So, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, part two here for um, everyone. What is the most difficult part about being an artist for you personally? Most difficult. Yeah. I think that the most difficult thing happens, uh, depends on what, what t what time of the year you're asking me. <laughs> right now, the most difficult t thing is to b have time in the studio. Trying to find time to make work is like a, a big one for me right now. So, um, but soon I'll have my summer and then I'll have more time. But the thing is also, it, it, sometimes the most difficult thing is for me to um, remember, I think the thing is, is that there is a whole uh, personal, um, like I need to be an artist because if I'm not an artist I'm gonna go crazy you know I just need that and you know it's like and I will I it's like well, I'm not in the studio for more than a week I'll start acting differently you know I think that's my time see <laughs> so, my time's up already so the thing is is that um, but that's kind of like a thinking of myself as an artist that needs you know I, I was it's almost kind of hard to speak about that too because like say well you know I was special because I was born an artist and I need this to be an artist and that kind of stuff and and part of me does be actually do, does actually believe that I mean I do kind of say I'm I need to make I need to make things I'm a, I, I, I mean whatever manner that would be maybe if I wasn't an artist I'd be a, a car I'd be uh, redesigning cars or something but but I have that ilk okay I think another thing though too is that I I like to think of that I'm uh, and that I want to know more about what I can do 
in the studio because I get excited about things I make in the studio. And I know that if I don't get excited about things in the studio that I have to think about why that is, you know. And I think once the time, once you reach, uh, once you have an epiphany in the studio, like I can remember a handful of times when I was in the studio where I went, I got goosebumps. You know, I completely like blew myself away. And it's like, I can't believe I made that. And then you kind of go, I'll never make that, I'll never, that, that, I wonder when's the next time I'll feel like that. Maybe that was the last time. Or, or you, make your, you make something that you're really happy with and you say, that's the best piece I ever made. And you kind of go, and if you're a positive mentality, you think, I wonder how many new discoveries I have left in me. Do I have, how many more, how many more things can I find out about myself by doing this, you know? So that's a very insular kind of answer to your question. But also I know from experience that it's not just making these things in your studio and having them all around you. <laughs> but you need to take them, then they need to go out. Then you need to let them go like, like children. It's like go and prosper or whatever. And now, but get out of here, you know? <laughs> so I think the thing is, is that the reason why that is because this happens you know without that this won't happen the whole idea that we're communicating and that we're only I'm only sending out my own I, I mean the things that I make are made just because I have these intentions and then that's the thing and I go and then somebody else comes and sees that thing with their history and they and they make sense of it hopefully they'll try to make sense of it with their history you know so the works are kind of like ambassadors in a sense, where they, they, they are, they're between two kinds of communication. So I, I thoroughly dig that, you know. And also, one thing that's really hard for talking about what our work is about, I can't remember who it was, the, 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 the quote from, but it was from, somebody asked a poet, can you explain this poem to me? <laughs> What's the meaning of this poem? And the poet says, what, you want me to make it worse? <laughs> 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 you know, by ex because there's a difference between prose and, and, and poetry, right? So we could be sociopolitical, but we're kind of like poets in a sense, where we want, like, we're, we're, we're creating visual poetry that hopefully you will also attain that kind of second language, visual language, and understand it non-verbally. Yeah. Anyways, that's what I think. Yeah, I guess I guess so, yeah. <laughs> I would give that out what he said, uh, um, but but also like the most. This is kind of a, a boring practical thing, but the hardest thing for me about being an artist is not making the work, but but it is actually dealing with like uh, the career side of it and any kind of business side of it. And really, it's really hard for me to give. Uh, doesn't rhyme with truck. Uh, no, <laughs> does rhyme with truck. I, it's hard for me to care about that aspect of things it's to my detriment. And I think like to have the to have the uh, to find that part of yourself as well to like take care of yourself and your career and put your work out there and kind of take part take care of that part of things I think is difficult for a lot of artists and, and, and that's one of my I think one of my failings is not like looking after stuff like that because it doesn't feel like that's part of being an artist but if it's not you're gonna have a harder time out there in the world so that's you know a practicality. You should probably do it. <laughs> I guess I, I just yeah I th I really appreciate what what Arthur had to say. Um, much more beautiful than the the basic practical thing I was going to come down to is just yeah uh, the struggles of balancing trying to earn a living or trying to keep your career afloat or trying to get time in your studio and finding that balance in life as an artist um, I have found to be challenging <laughs> you know there's been you know and and it's interesting because there's times where there's just incredible highs you know I have found that having this exhibition has been really delightful to be able to connect with all the artists in the show and to have this happen and yet behind the scenes there's times when the effort behind it you know luckily we didn't have to make a new catalog for this one but I had to twice with the last two and there's times when it's like, uh, okay, you know, this is tough, or, or moving that big sculpture one more time. <laughs> and um, anyway, um, but 
yeah, there, there's there's many things. I mean, and the self doubt, you know, um, that that comes up um, times. Uh, maybe I'd say times when I am not in my studio and I'm not feeling inspired to make something new, and I'm in this kind of lull of not working, and I have to have some faith that it's going to come back, you know. And part of it is because of time, you know, either teaching or doing other things. Um, but luckily, I, you know, d despite what um, certain people in my household might think, I trust that I'll, I'll, I'll get it back. <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, there's a lot of challenges. It's not an easy choice. You have to be, you know, you have to do it because you're crazy and you love doing it. I don't know. <laughs> so, okay. So I think for me, and I'm kind of a larger, some some scale. The, I know that art is a like a vitamin, like vitamin C. If you don't have vitamin C, you get scurvy. If you don't have art in your life, whether you make it or you appreciate it, if you don't have that, you diminish as a human being. You may not notice it. People don't notice when they're getting scurvy, but they're getting it. And you're starting to shrink. Your spirit is starting to shrivel. And that's a fact. And that's a fact we know. It's been proven uh, in research has shown that, that students in high school and junior high, the correlation between people who have been exposed to art and how much they've been exposed to art and how well they do on the SATs is direct. And there's no art questions on the SATs. But people who have art in their lives in school do better on SATs. So the, the hard part is that our society in the West, in America, doesn't value art. You have to struggle to make your case again and again. And here, I moved to Davis because the schools are so good. You know what the budget for art at, in Davis is? Uh, the actual budget committed by the Davis Joint Unified School District to art. Anybody guess? Wow, how'd you do that? There you go. All art training in Davis, the land of the great schools, is provided by the PTAs. That's crazy. And it's the hardest thing about being an artist, and it's my greatest hope. We are going to get this right, hopefully in our lifetimes. And thanks again to the Pence. <laughs>